Video game giants have been on a spending spree, and it looks like Ubisoft could be the next on their shopping list. Good morning, good Friday morning to you, the weekend is here. I'm Shane Satterfield from Sifted, and this is Good Morning Gaming for February 18th, 2022. It comes bright and early every weekday to our patrons who pledge at patreon.com sifted, and it's delayed a couple days for everyone else. If you like our content, we also have a separate podcast feed for our flagship show, Game Face, that you can find by searching your favorite podcast service. You'll find the podcast versions of the rest of our content in the same feed. You found this. So Ubisoft reported its financials today for the latest quarter. Its sales were down 31% year over year. But the comparison isn't really fair. At the end of 2020, the publisher had three big open-world games launched, including Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Immortals Phoenix Rising, and Watch Dogs Legion, while in 2021, it only had Far Cry 6 and Riders Republic. In a post-earnings conference call, Ubisoft CFO Frederick Duget said development on games set for release in the next fiscal year, like Avatar, Mario Plus Rabbids, and Skull and Bones was going well. That's right! Skull and Bones, speaking of video game zombies, somehow that game is still in development, and Ubisoft did admit that it has been shifted to a multiplayer-focused game. Duget acknowledged that the multiplayer-focused pirate game had been in development for a long time, but added the company is, quote, very happy, unquote, with the artistic direction and the progress of the game so far. The progress of the game so far. It's been in development for eight years. Most importantly, though, Ubisoft also stated that it's now open to considering being acquired after fighting off acquisition by Vivendi in 2015. Quote, We have always taken our decisions in the interest of our stakeholders, which are our players, employees, and shareholders. And this is coming from Yves Gaimont. So Ubisoft can remain independent. We have the talent, the industrial and the financial scale, and a large portfolio of powerful IP. Having said that, if there were an offer to buy us, the board of directors would of course review it in the interest of all stakeholders. Duget responded, We will not speculate on why people haven't made any offer, before Guimont interjected to specify, quote, unquote, if any offer was made. Huh. So there you have it. Ubisoft has changed its stance on being acquired. But exactly which dance partner makes the most sense? Is PlayStation off the table at this point? After spending so much on Bungie? I don't think anyone thought Sony would buy Bungie. So that came as a shock. But to acquire Ubisoft, it would, <laughs> it would take a lot more money. So I would say PlayStation's off the table. What about Xbox? Xbox has essentially a bottomless pit of money that it can do whatever it wants with. Now, the way it's been tiptoeing around the acquisition of Activision Blizzard leads me to believe that Xbox wouldn't test regulators with yet another acquisition. I, I just think you'd be pushing your luck at that point. And Microsoft is smart. It knows how to work around this stuff. So I don't think it's Xbox either. Nintendo is a little more interesting. Ubisoft aligns with Nintendo. It's a valuable partner of Nintendo. As I just said, they mentioned Mario Plus Rabbids, a game that's developed cooperatively between Ubisoft and Nintendo. Ubisoft has been one of the better third-party partners to Nintendo, releasing some of its big games on Nintendo platforms when other publishers wouldn't. Now, granted, some of those were cloud versions of its games, but still, it made the effort. Just today, Assassin's Creed, the Ezio collection, is launching on Switch. So, there's a relationship there. But the catch is that just in the last month, Nintendo expressed that it is not interested in buying huge publishers the way that PlayStation and Xbox have 
over the last couple of months. It said it prefers to build from within, acquiring talent and then assimilating that talent into Nintendo's culture. So while Nintendo makes the most sense and it has the money to do it and seems like the most likely of the big three, I still think it's highly unlikely. More likely, it feels to me like Ubisoft missed the party. (laughs) It is late to the party. Now, it does sound like maybe there were some offers made recently based on some things that Guimont and Duget said. But apparently those suitors weren't, they didn't have a big enough check. We'll put it that way. And it's hard for me to see where another big third-party publisher like EA or Take-Two would be interested in acquiring Ubisoft. So more likely, I feel like this verbiage is just Ubisoft saying, hey, we've got a dance card here if you want to sign it. But I think ultimately it's going to end up sitting at the edge of the dance floor with no one to dance with. Now for a couple more stories from the top of your SIFs. In a sign of just how desperate we are to get new information on Metroid Prime 4, (laughs) Retro Studios today updated its Twitter profile with a brand new banner for Metroid Prime 4. It's really the first piece of media that's come from the game other than the game's logo, which was revealed in a trailer. The game, it may not seem like it's been that long, but it's actually been three years since Metroid Prime 4 was taken from Bandai Namco, who was developing it, and handed to Retro Studios. Since then, Retro has completely remodeled its studio. We've seen job listings for talent regularly. It seems like it's about time for us to get a look at this game. It's been three years. Now, Retro doesn't exactly have a reputation for getting games done quickly, although it's it's improved over the years. But if you remember... The first Metroid Prime, if you go back and look through the history of that game's development, it was a nightmare. So I don't expect Retro to turn out games every two years, but it's been three. And you would imagine the game's starting to wrap up. It's probably feature complete at this point. There's probably a lot of polish to do. It might be time to finally get a look at Metroid Prime 4. Elden Ring review code is in the hands of critics. I know that firsthand because I have it. And consequently, there have been tons of leaks today for the game. There are spoilers out in the wild. Now, you guys are pretty well trained. You're used to this. You know the drill. You know the places not to go to get stuff spoiled for you. And it is the usual suspects this time. YouTube. There are videos on YouTube. In fact, we curated the opening cinematic for Elden Ring today from YouTube. And we're careful, obviously, to label it with spoilers to make sure you guys aren't getting into something you don't want to get into. And it will probably be taken down here in the next couple hours, honestly, because Bandai Namco has been zapping all the videos from YouTube. The bigger danger really is Reddit. Reddit A lot of the threads there have screenshots of things that you do not want to see. And a lot of times, as you know, when you're browsing on Reddit, you see things that you don't want to see. (laughs) You just can't help it. You go to the wrong thread, and one of the responses in the thread has a screenshot or whatever else, and there you go. There's no way to avoid it. So, I know it's tough, because Elden Ring doesn't come out for a while, and some of you guys probably use Reddit pretty regularly, but... If you're really concerned about avoiding spoilers, you probably want to stay away from there. You probably want to avoid searching for Elden Ring on YouTube and just know that we're looking out for you guys. We'll make sure that anything that we curate from the game is clearly labeled so you know exactly what's in the video before you watch it. In other Nintendo news, today Nintendo released a trailer for The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask for Nintendo Switch Online. The game launches in just eight days on February 25th. Now, we're a little nervous about the release of this game on Nintendo Switch Online because of the disaster. That's probably too strong of a word, but the poor performance of Ocarina of Time on Nintendo Switch Online. And obviously, Majora's Mask was built on the same engine, 
and there has been discussion about exactly what engine Nintendo is using for Nintendo Switch Online games. The bottom line is that we're all a little nervous about Zelda games going forward on the service, and Majora's Mask is going to be the next test. So we'll see how it goes. Remember Dead Island 2? Yep, I talked about it in Good Morning Gaming not that long ago, that there were rumors swirling that the game was not dead, and I appropriately called it, I believe, the video game zombie zombie or something to that effect. A video game about zombies zombie. Well, today, Embracer Group, the company that will ultimately publish Dead Island 2 if it does release, basically said it's on the way. <laughs> it, it had its big financial report today. And one thing I, w- I should say, too, is that Embracer Group is growing. It may become the next big third-party publisher. Its sales and revenue were up like a 100 and some percent year over year. It has acquired so many other companies and developers. It is definitely one to watch. But anyway... Today, as it reported its impressive sales, it also received questions during a Q&A about Dead Island 2. And it really left very little doubt that the game is on the way. And not only that, that the game is not that far away. During the Q&A, the host and Embracer CEO, Lars Wingifers, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, had a back and forth on the recent speculation about Dead Island 2. And he said, quote, It's very clearly still alive. And I at least expect the release this financial year. Or sorry, next financial year, I should say. I can't talk about Dead Island 2 because it's not announced as such from the publisher. But we have just talked about that. We have one unannounced AAA title that you think is Dead Island 2. So it's hard for me to comment further on that. But I am excited about unannounced titles. So essentially, Dead Island 2... Back from the Dead, Video Game Zombie, coming in the next financial year, probably in early 2023. In even more Nintendo news, today Nintendo launched a brand new My Nintendo store. You can buy pretty much anything there. It basically blends together My Nintendo points, things that you can buy with your My Nintendo points, My Nintendo rewards, I should say. And then it offers consoles, controllers, all kinds of cool stuff. Merchandise, including some store exclusives, stuff that you can only get from the online store. Also, if your order is over 50 bucks, you get shipping for free. Also, to celebrate the kickoff of the new store, some select first-party Nintendo Switch games are selling for 40 bucks. I checked out the site. There's some pretty sweet Nintendo merch there. It has hats, shirts, sweatshirts, including... Metroid Dread merch. I would check it out if I were you over the weekend. Head to nintendo.com slash store. All right, let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll tackle today's boss fight. Welcome to today's boss fight where I tackle random topics that may or may not be related to video games. Today Ars Technica shared that it's been working with MPD Group to generate a report on physical versus digital game sales. The numbers to me weren't all that shocking. We all know that the industry is moving towards digital. The number keeps creeping up. It's been around 50-50 for a while, but based on this new report, It's over 50-50 now. More digital games are being released than ever. And a lot of games aren't being released as physical releases anymore when in the past they would be. In terms of distinct game titles released in the U.S., the raw number of new games available on physical media, like discs and cartridges, dropped from 321 in 2018 to just 226 in 2021. That's nearly 30% down in just... Four years. The number of digital games released each year, on the other hand, remained relatively flat from 2018 through 2020. But then, in 2021, that number (laughs) went crazy to nearly 2,200 
digital games, which is a 64% increase from 2020. Across PlayStation consoles, the number of physical releases is down almost 40% from 2018 to 2021. On Xbox, it's nearly 31%. The Switch is kind of the holdout here, which is interesting. Its decrease is less than 7% over the same period. So you have 38% at PlayStation, 31% at Xbox, and only 7% at Nintendo. I don't know if the cartridges for Switch make them appear to be more collectible, or maybe Nintendo fans are just all about physical goods. I don't know. It's interesting to consider that. Then if you turn to the major publishers, and you know what those are, a slight majority, 56%, of distinct titles released in 2021 were available as physical releases. So over 50%, but not much over. And you got to remember, not that long ago, it was 100%. This is how they released their games. What's most shocking to me, though, is the total number of video games released each year. And I know this wasn't really the focus of this study between Ars Technica and MPD, but this is what stood out the most to me. The total number of video games released each year from major publishers has been rapidly declining for the last four years in a row in a steady downwards trajectory. And I mean, it is in a straight line down at about a 45 degree angle, but even. <laughs> like it's steadily declining on that arc. In 2018, 279 games were released by major publishers. And in 2021, it was just 158. Now you may say, Shane, that's because of the pandemic. It's not. Two years before the pandemic started, it had already started this decline. And it has continued on that same 45 degree angle down. There's no deviation. So publishers are just releasing way less games compared to when they used to. If we were to compare 2021 to, say, 2006 with the PlayStation 2, it would blow your mind how many games were released in a year from major publishers on that platform. It's nuts how much fewer games we're getting from the big boys. But what I really want to talk about is the focus of the report, which is you guys are not buying physical games anymore. I am. <laughs> if I have the opportunity, I still buy physical games. And I honestly have no idea why you guys don't do it. No idea whatsoever. If PlayStation or Xbox were to announce that you could sell your digital library, I would understand it a lot more. Now look, your library isn't going to go away. When I die, I will will my accounts for all three consoles and Steam and any other place I have game libraries to my brother or to my nieces and nephews or whatever. My account will live on and eventually they can change it from Dinfire to whatever they want to change it to, but all my games will still be there. So there's value there, but you can't sell them unless you want to sell them to your family, which would just be gross. <laughs> so you can't really sell them. They have no value. So my question is, why? Why do you guys resist physical media so much? And by you guys, I mean the people on the site that tend to be younger than me and don't want physical media. I've heard the reasons before, and maybe they've changed over time, and maybe you guys have different reasons, but the ones I constantly hear is that people don't want to have to get up and walk to their console when they switch games. As I said, I have bought all the major games on physical media. These games take 40, 50 hours to complete. I don't know how often you're getting up. I never get up. I don't understand that. Have we become so lazy that we don't want to walk to our console once every three days? I mean, that's absurd. And then the other thing I hear is that people don't want junk. It, they want everything to be minimal. They want their living space to be clean. I get that. I'm kind of like that too. Like my mom comes to wherever I live and she's like, oh my gosh, Shane, your place is empty. It's not. To her it is. Because my parents, their homes were nothing like that. There was just stuff everywhere. And so I'm kind of in the middle of my parents and you guys. So I understand on a certain level, you don't want just junk everywhere. I get that. But... It's not that bad. 
<laughs> I don't know. To me, that's what closets and shelving units and entertainment centers are for. I just don't think it's a big deal. I already have a nice little collection of PlayStation 5 games, physical games. Probably 10, 11 games already, something like that, which isn't a lot. I would have had a lot more in prior generations. But I really struggle to see the detriment of physical media. Other than the environmental issues of the plastic and the discs and that, I do understand that, that part of it. So if you're to tell me that you're really concerned about the environment, I'll accept that totally. I'm not crazy environmentalist guy. I try to have as small a footprint as I can, but I also feel like I need to be realistic at the same time. And then it, when you start thinking about the financial side of it, you're not paying less for digital games. And again, if you were, I could understand more of why people are so against physical media or don't want physical media anymore. If you could get the digital games cheaper, which I believe you should, Pactor tried to explain why digital games cost as much as physical, and I wasn't buying what he was selling on that one. But if they were cheaper, I could understand that. They're not. You're spending just as much for something that you can't resell. And maybe part of it is that you guys have lived a lot of your lives in this middle ground where I'm at now, where I don't need everything physical, but in the interest of having something that you can recoup value from, some of the stuff I get physical. Maybe you've never even been around that environment to understand how it works. But if you were like me, and as you were growing up, you were buying lots of physical video games. Those video games, some of them, are going to be worth a lot of money. Some of the ones I have are going to be worth a lot of money. Dozens of games that are worth $300 or $400 or more. I got them for $40 or $50, well, most of them. And now they're worth hundreds of dollars. And one thing I will say is I really fear that I pass before my wife because it will be a big job for her to try to sell that stuff and get equal value for it. It probably would be a nightmare, and she probably will just have a yard sale where she'll sell God Hand for like 50 cents or whatever, sealed God Hand for 50 cents. But financially, buying these games, they go up in value. And if you think about it, if this trend continues, and it's gonna, to where there's no physical media anymore, the value of this stuff is just going to keep going up because it's the last quote-unquote, generation of physical media. So I really struggle to see many advantages to going all digital other than having like an OCD about clutter or having some weird idea that you're going to have to get up every hour to like switch games. I, I don't get that either. Again, I buy physical and I never have to get up and change the disc in my console. Very rarely. So let me know. Why is it that you're so tied to this idea of not having physical media? Is it the disc switching thing? Is it minimalism? Is it the environment? Let me know. What is really keeping you from buying physical media in 2022? Thanks for listening to Good Morning Gaming. I appreciate every single one of you who listens to Good Morning Gaming. I'm Shane Satterfield, and you can do what the cool kids do and follow me on Twitter at Dinfire and follow Sifted at Sifted Games. We're actually going to be off on Monday. It is a three-day weekend and a national holiday here in the United States, so we'll be back with Good Morning Gaming on Tuesday morning. Until then, make sure you seize today, because there will never be another.